I would like to thank the Oculus family for inviting me in this extraordinary lounge. Um, and I'm going to try to speak about the Pentacam, the Corvis, the history and what uh, we have now. So these are my financial disclosure. I'm very happy to have uh, been collaborating with Oculus since many years. And actually, since many years, I found this photo that I know that it looks very exactly the same as how I look now. I'm not older at all, but you know, this is a poster that I presented in Arvo 11 years ago. And I found this picture and I said, well, you know how much we have done in many years, because like that, I remember that we had nothing whatsoever. We didn't have stiffness parameter. We didn't have CBI, TBI. So what I did then is I wanted to do a little bit of timeline of what we have achieved in the last years. And since the launch of the Corvis, that was more than 10 years ago, we have done so much and we have tried every time to put science before like showing every uh, um, showing you what is commercially available. We started with normality values, then we went on with the CBI. Then uh, at the same time, we showed that the CBI was able to detect subclinical keratoconus, then the TBI. Then Cinzia Robert showed stiffness parameters that were useful for many things. And then we decided to, you know, combine the technologies together to create the TBI. That was an amazing work done by Renato Ambrosio. And we were uh, very grateful to be part of that uh, uh, paper that now also, and you will see it at the end, has a new version, uh, the TBI version two. But then we evolved and we worked on cross-linking uh, Chinese CBI. So so I think that uh, Corvis has showed in clinical practice to be not only useful, but there are many societies that actually are saying that the use of biomechanics is very important together with tomography. So now we have another tool in the Oculus family. So why is it useful and how can we move it to the new technology and why I think that using OCT and epithelial mapping in general is absolutely mandatory if you, use, if you do anterior segment. So I'm going to uh, concentrate on two main topics. One is ectasia, ectasia detection, and the second one is refractive surgery and fixing complication. So I wanted to just speak about theory, because I, I think that there is a lot of um, misunderstanding in the scientific community, because in the scientific community, there are fashions. So there are some period of, of science in which something is like brand new, we all want it, but we don't really understand what is before what. So the pathophysiology of keratoconus has two different things that we can evaluate, is shape, that is tomography, known OCT, for example, shine fluke, and then you have tomography OCT that it also adds epithelial maps. And then you have structure and risk factors, such as corneal biomechanics and tear film analysis and genetics. So by definition, the cycle of keratoconus starts with a normal cornea. You're not born with keratoconus. And as Cinzia Roberts showed us, there is one moment in which there is a focal reduction of corneal biomechanical properties. We don't know how this happens. It might be genetics, it might be eye rubbing, it might be inflammation. So possibly that's the only moment in which you can detect something before anything happens in the cornea, right? After that, you have a change in the structure of the cornea. So by definition, if you have a sensitive uh, technology, that's the moment in which tomography is 100% normal and you have just a change in biomechanics. Whether what we have now, it's sensitive enough to see when only biomechanics is, is different, this, this is another thing, but this is the theory. And then I want to speak about tomography. If you have a change, uh, so you have the triggering factor, then you have a modification in the structure, then the tomography is beginning to change. So you will have a change in posterior elevation and in the stroma in general. So it's crucial that you understand that epithelium cannot change if the stroma does not change. 
you have to understand this because there is a fashion that the epithelium is different, is changed, everything else is normal, it's keratoconus. It, it is not possible. If the stroma changes, then the epithelium changes because it's remodeling based on the curvature of the stroma. And that is really crucial that you understand this because why we need OCT? Obviously, it might also improve the sensitivity of our device, so it might improve the detection of a keratoconus. But what I believe, and also what Puja has beautifully showed, that most of the time it will improve the specificity. So it will tell you this looks like keratoconus, but the epithelium is thick in an area where it is steep, so it is not a keratoconus. So I'm going to show you, first of all, one paper that actually showed that combining epithelial thickness with, with CBI and TBI, that was just a theoretical paper, so it, it, it was not done inside the Oculus um, team, but they showed that they could improve sensitivity and specificity. So this is the one paper in which they already proved that that could make a difference. So let's see in clinical practice. So a couple of the examples I'm going to show you, they are not done with the Pentacam OCT because we received it in one month. So obviously we have years and years of work with epithelial mumps. So for example, this is an old case in which uh, this is a corneal wall page. So um, there is an inferior steepening. So if you have a thickening of the epithelium, as Puja showed, it can be, for example, the lid, that is pushing the epithelium down, it can be inflammation or it can be contact lens. But if you have a thick epithelium over a steep part, so thick over a steep part, it cannot be keratoconus. So for example, this patient discontinued contact lens and then it was fine. So I'm going to show you another interesting case. So this was a patient referred to me for unilateral keratoconus. We know that unilateral keratoconus is almost never there. So when you hear monolateral keratoconus, you're always, hmm, I'm not sure. So that's why we call it very asymmetric ectasia, because very asymmetric ectasia is, is normally what it is. And the patient was sent to me for cross-linking. And she was 49 years old with a sudden decrease of vision uh, with monolateral keratoconus, which doesn't really sound right. So this was uh, the pentacam. You can see that was an inferior steepening in the right eye, whether the left eye was looking normal. And what always uh, Renato is, is saying that is an evolution. So we don't bin what we have before. So look at the posterior elevation. You see that the posterior elevation is just 10 microns, which doesn't really sound like keratoconus, does it? So. Obviously, we had everything. We had epithelial maps, we had biomechanics. So we did biomechanics in both eyes, and uh, you will see that the CBI is 0 0.30 in both eyes. Um, so I went back and I had a look at the epithelial maps, and the epithelium was thick in the area where it was steep. So I went back to the patient and said, look, there is something you didn't tell me what happened in the last 12 months. And she said, actually, I forgot because many months ago, I had a small incident in my kitchen. There was one drop of boiling oil that went to my eye, but I was seeing well for months, so I forgot about it. So she had an hyperplastic epithelium that developed in months. And I said, you don't need cross-linking. We just need to remove your epithelium and let it grow back. And now she's 20-20 unaided. So obviously even cross-linking would have solved there because they would have removed the epithelium, but you know, the, the riboflavin and the UV light would have been for free. So first take home message. Epithelium, I'm sure, will help us in diagnosis corneal ectasia in combination, not over corneal topography, tomography, and biomechanics. Epithelium in corneal ectasia is thin over the steep area. And be careful with color scale, because there are some OCTs that you might have a thick epithelium, as I showed you before, as red. So what about my previous Pentacam scans? Can I still use them? As Renato introduced, we can still use the previous Pentacam and do differential maps, which is a great add-on, because sometimes you move to the new technology and you have to build your database again that maybe you have done in years. So refractive surgery. So when do you need epithelium in refractive surgery? Always. So if you do refractive surgery and you don't do epithelial mapping every single patient, there is a problem. Why? You need it in pre-op, for, particularly for trans-PRK. You need it all the time in PTK. You need it in normal post-op to, to evaluate remodeling and regression. And if you have an abnormal post-op, to fix it. 
So for pre-op planning, this is going to be a very quick slide. So this is just to show you if you do a trans-PRK for a hyperopic patient and you do not take into account the thickness of the epithelium, if the epithelium is thicker than normal, you might do a wrong correction. If the epithelium is thinner, you use more tissue. So it is absolutely crucial in trans-PRK that you know exactly your epithelial thickness. And obviously, the more is the resolution, the better it is. So what about complex patients? So imagine that you have to do a PTK patient with a, in a patient with epithelial basement bandment dystrophy. It's crucial that you know the thickness of the epithelium. And now I wanted to finish up my talk with one, the summary, because you know you have seen that the um, topic of my presentation were the three pillars. So I, have, I, I found a case, we were lucky enough to got this patient that is really showing how the three pillars are useful. Plus, I'm, I'm sorry, but you will still need to use your brain. So you cannot forget to use your brain. That's always important. So it was a patient coming, thank God, from another clinic. This patient was done on hyperopic lasing in 2009 for a plus four and plus five. Guess what? The patient regressed. And they decided to do a four retouches and flap relift. Four. And the patient was sent up for ectasia. Obviously, very poor vision. And obviously, epithelial ingrowth. You do a four times flap relief. I mean, it's, if you're, you're really lucky if you don't have epithelial ingrowth. So is it uh, regression? Is it epithelial ingrowth or is it ectasia? Let's see the pentacam. So you can see that there is a clear, very bad steepening in the center. There is no increase in posterior elevation. As always, you still need to use your brain. You have epithelial ingrowth here. And obviously, you have this red spot that is compatible with the, with the, you know, with the nipropic ablation, retouches, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you know if the patient is ectasia? Well, first of all, looking at the posterior elevation, which doesn't sound like ectasia, for progression. And then you can use the CBI LVC, which is an index that was de developed to detect ectasia after surgery. So here, showing you how even corneal biomechanics can help in the post-op. And this patient was zero of CBI LVC. So no posterior elevation, your brain. CBI LVC is zero. Science. So this patient does not have ectasia. Okay, so now we have a patient that has a very bad regression with epithelial ingrowth, and then you have to treat the patient. So how do you treat a patient like that if you don't know the epithelium? Look at the epithelium here. It's 39 in the center, and you have up to 70 in the mid-periphery. It's absolutely impossible to treat the patient. And let me show you that you may say, well, I don't need a high-resolution epithelial map or a high-resolution nice OCT to know that the epithelium is thick. Yeah, I'm going to show you the high-resolution epithelial, the high-resolution OCT here, and you can clearly see that what is called here it's the, this hyperopic scar that you see underneath the flap, because most of the time you can see it when they do PRK, but you can also see it underneath the flap, and the here is really crucial to know how to retreat the patient. And, this was, and I'm going to finish up with this take-home message that tomography is always mandatory. Corneal biomechanics has showed us to help us in many ways. OCT with epithelial maps is an additional fundamental tool for screening, post-refractive surgery, and fixing complication. And thank you very much.